All right, so this is the video for the class um, about Aristotle's virtues. Um, I am going to call it spiritual humanism because it's based on a view of humanity and the foundational principle is that human beings by nature desire to understand. They're capable of seeing patterns in the world and that was is what has made them evolutionarily successful because there are patterns in the world, right? The world is by nature ordered. We evolved as the creature that's capable of understanding that order. And we also are the creature who lives for the sake of something greater than ourselves. So every religious tradition is about something greater than yourself and figuring out how to acknowledge that, how to develop that, and uh, how to pursue the highest uh, level of life, right? The good virtue that you can. Um, so in, in uh, appearances, when you look at just the words or the doctrines, the religions and humanism disagree on doctrine. But if you look at the actual way of life underlying each of these sets of words, this course emphasizes what's similar and it's similar because it's based on the human condition and we're all in it together. And our, we have a lot more in common as human beings than we have differences because our particular cultural context meant that we learned to exercise these virtues in uh, associated with either a certain religion or a certain humanistic tradition. Um, but this course is gonna emphasize the way of life and the actual virtues, what I consider the real thing. So whenever you attach reason, faith, or your idea of the good to reason, you're going to come up with these basic virtues. So um, you have a number of different outlines assigned, and you have one reading, and that longer reading is 18 pages. They're not long pages. They might be confusing. You don't have to understand every word. The overall idea is that human beings as human beings have a, a sense of flourishing. What does it mean to be a good carpenter? That's that you can make stuff. What is it a good doctor? You can create health or re, re, help patients regain their health. What is a good human being just as a human being, right? So we're going to look at the different capacities people have as human beings. And the virtues are just actually exercising those capacities in a healthy way. So I think this is common sense. If you just let yourself think of it as common sense. So sometimes the language is not familiar. But if you just keep thinking of, well, what is this actually about? that I do every day in my life. And um, then I think it's that you can get past the language, okay? So we're the creature destined to try and understand. We're born with the potential and we begin life from the day they're born. Children are treated a certain way. They're, and they respond to that treatment. And that those relationships are what start to form their character, right? So they have their physical development, but right from the beginning, a child can be hungry and just have this acute hunger deeply embedded in their head, right? Or a child can have fear. They can be exposed to danger, whether from a parent or they're in a, a terrible war situation or they can be exposed to love, right? And just unconditional love, parents that even though they're sleep deprived, 
the kid screams all night, certain parents let it get to them, right? And they squeeze their kid or they hit their kid. Well, that imprints and that forms the kid's character. But what they really need in order to flourish and everybody, you know, this is common sense child psychology. They need to be loved unconditionally. But then they also need to be taught through example to exercise virtue, right? Otherwise, the kid becomes a spoiled brat. Like my parents will love me even if I'm a nasty little <laughs> SOB, right? No, you have to exercise the virtues. You have to set the example. You have to take pleasure in virtue. And then you have to expect as a matter of course that your children do the same. You don't scold them if they're not virtuous because the implication is it's not pleasant, but you have to do it. You're supposed to raise them so they take pleasure in self-control. So they take pleasure in saying thank you. It's not they have to say thank you. You have to have respect. No, why would you not want to have respect for your parents, right? So that's how you want to train a child. If you really want them to grow up to have integrity, to have virtue and wisdom. They have to want to be virtuous and wise. They have to take pleasure in the fact that they know they are that way. They, they don't, uh, they're not envious of people. They don't judge other people. They, you know, if somebody uh, acts in a, a wicked way, right? They, you know, they might, feel bad for them because wicked people never are happy. They never have nice friends. They never have enough money or enough power. They're internally conflicted. There's nothing to be jealous of. Um, that would be wisdom. That would be virtue attached to wisdom. But there's many, many steps to it, right? Starts out the two most fundamental virtues and the ones that can make or break a person or a society are temperance and courage, because these are the virtues. These are the pleasure and fear. Temperance is the virtue in relation to the pleasures of eating, drinking, and sex. And they're very intense pleasures. They're connected to our survival, and they can throw people off. People can really get mis- habituated, can get wrongly habituated in relationship to eating, drinking, sex, and then fear, vulnerability. We know we're vulnerable and we know there are things to be afraid of, but it's very easy to, to be phobic, to be too afraid or not afraid enough. So let me explain these more in a more complex way. Okay, and it's, again, it's common sense in relation to eating. Your body needs food, and it needs a certain kinds of food. What? Protein, minerals, vitamins, fiber, whatever. And um, the, the person who's wise eats the right thing for the right reason, not for emotional reasons, in the right way, not too fast, at the right time, not right before bed. Um, and they do it consistently and they do it over time and they do it and they take pleasure in doing it. A person who's morally strong doesn't really want to eat all that health food. <laughs> they want to eat sugar, <laughs> sugar, salt, and fat, right? Um, but they do it. They do the right thing, but they don't really enjoy it. And physiologically, they're internally conflicted and their body chemistry is not as healthy because they desire the wrong thing. People who are morally weak desire the wrong things and they give in, right? And then they are even less healthy, right? But usually they have regrets. That's why they're morally weak. Like I know what I ought to eat, but I really want to eat this. And then they eat it, they regret it, and you know they can get back to it. So they tend to fluctuate again. They fluctuate in both what they desire 
and in what they actually do. The morally strong person is conflicted in what they desire, but not what they do. Okay, the self-indulgent person um, just decides it doesn't matter what I eat. Um, if I'm going to die, I'm going to die, right? So some people will say, God will take me when it's my time. So I'm going to eat all this hamburgers and French fries, whatever I want. And if I get heart disease, it's because God, you know, wants to take me or something. That is, that's when you split faith from reason, right? So the liberal arts tradition, which our founding fathers are very concerned about, because it's related to preserving democracy. And Socrates the same way. You have to examine yourself and examine each other. The virtues or vices that you carry in your heart resonate out into your relationships and they affect public life. So if you decide, you know, God's gonna take me anyway, and then you eat lousy food, so the so that food that is not good for you sells better. So there's more of it. So it gets sold at a cheaper price. So people buy more of it, right? So then corporations who that make it pay for political, um, pay for political campaigns. And when their person they supported gets elected, they tell them, we want you to make a law to subsidize corn so that we can have cheaper corn syrup and we can put it in our crappy junk food and people will get diabetes and heart disease, but we'll get rich and the doctors will get rich and the diabetes companies will get rich and the drug companies will get rich and everybody will get rich and people's bodies will fall apart. But hey, it's God's will. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's just... As a representative of the liberal arts tradition, this is not God's will, right? If you unify reason and faith, God wants us to study nutrition. God wants us to eat the right thing for the right reason. And God wants us to take pleasure in that, right? Have purity of heart and not judge other people. That would be the highest level, right? So you could say, well, nobody can achieve that. Well, but we aim for it, right? You, you, uh, you can't achieve a goal if you don't know what the goal is. So you know what the goal is, and then you know how close it is you are toward the goal. And then you can teach yourself how to eat and how to take pleasure in it. You just have to educate yourself and train yourself. That's why college is important. Because that's when you start to decide, how am I going to habituate myself? So far, my teachers, uh, my parents, all these other people have tried to habituate me and tell me what to do. Now I have to decide. And I have to decide to take pleasure in doing the right thing. Then I'll become a wise and virtuous person. With um, alcohol, with drinking, so there's the normal thirst, but usually people are referring to alcohol. Now, um, people will disagree on how much is too much, right? So some people think no drinking, right? And Aristotle was not one of those. The Greeks drank, but in moderation. And if you got drunk, that was barbaric. That's not civilized. There's someone in Homer's Iliad who was known for getting drunk, and he was not a respected person. So, um, so some people think, well, I only drinking on holidays, that's the mean between extremes. And somebody else will say, well, only drinking on weekends, right? Maybe a party on Saturday night or something. And you don't drink too much. You don't get drunk. You don't drink fast. You don't drink because you can't socialize unless you have some alcohol, right? You don't need the alcohol. Um, and then uh, some people will argue, well, I only drink at night. That's the mean, right? I don't drink during the day. 
Um, and then some people will say, well, I need one beer before philosophy class, and it makes so much more sense. <laughs> so mainly people disagree on how much is too much, but you can do a statistical analysis and you can figure out 7% of people all over the world because of their body chemistry are prone to alcoholism. Every person deeply affects the lives of at least three other people. That's 28% of the population. That's why I don't drink. I don't drink for political reasons because it has a terrible negative effect on political life, on the culture. Um, so many of my students have been sexually assaulted, sexually harassed. Almost always the person was drunk or had drunk too much, right? Uh, with date rape, 85% of date rapes are under the influence of alcohol. So when students are making jokes about being drunk or something, I do not understand why that's funny. You know, it does so much harm. But that's my business, right? I don't judge people if they drink in moderation, but I choose not to because of the harm that it does. There's many other things I could do with my money and with my calories. Um, then there's sex. Okay, wow. Sex is a very powerful force. It's very pleasant, right? It's not something you should feel guilty about. So the Greeks completely disagree with Puritans who think sex is nasty or dirty or evil or something like that. That is not healthy, it's not natural, and it makes people obsessive, right? They have to fixate, don't think about sex. Well, all you're doing is thinking about sex. <laughs> so, so it's better just to admit, yeah, right? The thought about sex crosses my mind pretty often, but there's a lot of other things that also cross my mind. And I'd rather, I prefer to think about a good life End up and to put my sex life in the context of a much more, um, a much higher quality of life. Life isn't just about sex. So people who understand culture and civilization, people who are virtuous, would want to tie their sex life to a person with whom they want to make a long-term commitment because they want to build a history with that person because we are historical creatures. They want to have a relationship with the person where not only do they talk to them, but they go through experiences together. They go through ups and downs together. They support each other in their, their other goals in life, right? The goal isn't just to have good sex and it isn't just to have a good relationship. It's to have a relationship within the context of doing all these other things, pursuing justice, truth, beauty, developing a high quality of community life. Um, it could be the church community. It could be the civic community. It could be uh, any other kind of community. So, so there is, to, people argue, right? Too much, too little, the mean. Some people think um, you have to be, it has to be heterosexual. Well, there's no evidence that being non-heterosexual prevents you from exercising every other virtue. So as long as sexual orientation is not a vice, it's just a different body chemistry. And so that's the reason Lyon College accepts people regardless of sexual orientation. There's no evidence that they're any less human, right? If you're a pedophile, all right, I think Lion would say we don't accept uh, pedophiles who think it's perfectly fine to be a pedophile. Don't come here. <laughs> that is perverse, right? That is evil. But they don't, you know, they don't say that. Um, they, you know, they assume that either you won't come or you won't admit it, right? But anyway, the fact they say sexual orientation means there's no vice in that orientation. 
Um, also, male, female, race, your level of intelligence, your capabilities are exactly the same. So your capability for virtue and vice, exactly the same. Some people think premarital sex is okay. Some people think extramarital sex is okay. Um, but in general, uh, people, the main idea, I think extramarital sex personally is not okay because marriage means you made a commitment and you're a trustworthy person. So the whole idea is that you trust people. Um, and so to me, if you are going to have a partner, but also have other affairs, I would say, don't get married. That's fine. You just have a partner, you know, there has to be some place where you, you make a commitment. So certain people want to make this commitment. Once they make it, they ought to be able to trust the other person and agree that there's no extramarital sex. And certainly they, they don't do it in secret. So there are, but there are absolutely certain lines to draw. Plus children need stability. And because the sex drive is powerful, in general, societies make laws that reinforce and incentivize that parents stay together. So there's economic incentives, there are tax incentives, there's social incentives, so that the children have a stable life. Economically stable, emotionally stable. There are many, many adults who because of their vices or their moral weaknesses, are really incapable of long-term committed sexual relationships and parenting because it requires a lot of virtue. So definitely on this model, divorce would be the better option in certain situations. Ideally, you have two mature parents raising mature, wise children, right? As a matter of fact, what do we have, you know? And people have to make judgments. What is my marriage really? Is the person I'm married to capable of a long-term commitment? Are they having a positive influence in the formation of the children? Or am I better off? <laughs> yeah, are we better off divorced and the children will have better role models and they'll have a more secure environment? But my main point is that it's common sense what a, a child needs. And then people make judgments. Uh, when they're going to get divorced, they make judgments. And the, the number one criteria should always be what is best for the kids. But staying together is not necessarily always best for the kids, right? There's plenty of reasons why it wouldn't be so. So Aristotle's view doesn't have absolutes, right? You absolutely this, absolutely that, because some of those absolutes lead to the crippling of human flourishing. So the only absolute is to flourish, to develop wisdom, to exercise virtue for its own sake and take pleasure in it. And in order to achieve that goal, or at least to head toward that goal, you're constantly making judgments about what's best in the circumstances. And that's why Socrates is saying, you know, you constantly examine yourself and you constantly examine each other in order to live a good life, personal, social, political. Everything you do either weaves the society together to make a stronger culture or unravels it, right? You can't not decide. You're either weaving together or you're unraveling, <laughs> but you're always relating. Everyone is always relating to other people. And um, so you have to be conscientious about that. Just little things like, do you smile at your neighbors when you walk by? Or do you look away or do you actually scowl at them? 
do you act like you don't trust them? Do you trust them, right? So um, Aristotle said that in order to have any level of culture and civilization and ultimately democracy, people have to trust each other and they have to have good will for each other. They have to want each other to flourish. They're not indifferent, but they have to care about each other, right? You can't, of course, spend your whole life trying to literally help other people flourish, but you always have goodwill for them and you help them when you can. All right, generosity. Oh, courage is another big one, right? Fear. So right away from when kids are born, they learn to trust or they learn to fear. They learn that adults are violent or they learn that adults are kind. They learn, and so gradually, if they grow up where adults are all virtuous and just, they have to learn that not everybody is, right? So there is a transition there where they have to go from innocence and naivete to actually being able to judge other people's characters. Um, not judge them in the sense of evil. I mean, somebody might be crippled, right? And they are violent, but you don't need to condemn them. You just need to figure out how to relate to them, whether to trust them. And also in my mind, you wonder how they got that way. They weren't born that way. And how, if there's any way out, is there any way they can um, change and flourish, right? But anyway, we fear a lot of things. We fear pain, aging, death, but we fear loss of our friends. We fear loss of our status, loss of respect. We fear not being able to get a job. We fear not being able to keep the job, right? There's so many ways we're vulnerable. We, and we ought to fear climate uh, extreme, climate events. And we haven't been afraid enough of it. We haven't been able to anticipate it. We are going to have it. It is going to affect your life more than anything else. And we haven't been afraid enough of that. So, so human beings argue a lot about what's worth being afraid of because we're vulnerable and we're aware of it. And because children grow up with habits about fear, the kid that grows up with violent, untrustworthy parents doesn't fear anybody else, doesn't trust anybody else either. And they can't distinguish between who's trustworthy and who's not. And so politicians, power hungry people can easily punch the fear button and people will overreact in situations of fear. But people are also capable of underreacting, right? Not being afraid enough. And so that would be rash when you take on, uh, when you make yourself more vulnerable than you need to be, when you put yourself in dangerous situations unnecessarily, that would be the vice of being rash. But most people are more vulnerable to cowardice, to being afraid. And it isn't just afraid of pain or aging and using all sorts of therapies, um, the medical profession, the pharmaceutical profession. Um, there's all sorts of businesses that profit on people's excess fear of pain and of aging and of death. And it's costing your generation a lot of money for my generation's irrational fears. And so that's just one way in which there's a re relationship between the generations. People in my generation ought to teach themselves not to fear pain, aging, or death for the sake of not consuming so many healthcare and health-related products and racking up a huge debt. I read somewhere the average American, by the time they die, has $300,000 in debt that they pass on <laughs> to their grandparent kids, right? Terrible, right? Terrible. But that goes, so the thing about Aristotle is you hear these data points 
And then what I want to teach you is you can put them on a map, right? They're related to this list of virtues, and those virtues are related to the human condition. So anywhere you go in the world, and anytime you read history, people are subjected to these same experiences of pleasure and fear, and they go to the same extremes, or they're tempted to go to the same extremes. And that's why Greek mythology is stories of what look like people, right? Gods or people, but they're really just archetypes representing a pattern in the way that kinds of ways people make good and bad choices. Okay, so another big fear is the fear of not getting a job or not getting a good job or not being able to keep your job. And, um, and also loss of your status. So when Socrates went out and questioned the Athenians, um, he knew that he could get killed for it, but he was exhibiting moral courage, right? The courage of his convictions. This is what he thought the gods wanted him to do. The Oracle at Delphi was inspired him to do this. So, the tradition of liberal arts, this is what God wants you to do. Examine yourself and other people. This is what teachers like me have been telling students like you for 2,500 years. In every country that allowed Plato to be read, which was not the majority of countries, incidentally. Okay, generosity is really important. It can be giving away money. Um, but in our country at this time, it's particularly uh, concerned with which things that people need. What do people need in order to flourish economically? Well, they need education. They need K through 12. In a lot of ways to get a middle class job, they need college. Well, then if everybody needs it, then the, the, it should be government run because if you just have a private sector control of education whoever has the most money will get a great education if you don't have money you'll get nothing so there will be highly educated people and illiterate people and the gap between them will just grow and grow so if people need education to get a decent middle class job the government should provide it because it's common to everyone. So you should tax people to pay for public education and you should tax people according to their income. So richer people should get taxed more in order to weave together a middle class. Otherwise you will not have a middle class. This should not be given over to the private sector. If it is, anytime you have someone selling you at profit, something you have to buy, they are going to jack up the price and lower the quality, right? No brainer. That's how you make money. So public education is a necessity. Basic public health care. People need to be healthy to get to work to get to school, to do anything else. That's a basic thing. That should be provided by the government. Um, otherwise, the rich can get the best health care, the poor get nothing, and people in the healthcare industry will sell you the best, the worst product at the highest price, and you have to buy it, okay? Um, but those are the kind of debates that we get into. What should be private? What should be public? Public transportation, public, um, public parks, for example. Otherwise, the rich can get a house with a big backyard and a swimming pool, and the poor get nothing. If you pay taxes, you can have public parks, public swimming pools. Everybody gets to exercise. Everybody gets to have a basic minimum quality of life. So you have to decide, you know, what do people need to flourish? 
and those basic needs, we need to collectively pay for them. And there, and because we're trying to create a middle class, if you want a democracy, you've got to have a middle class. Um, that's why Aristotle thought generosity was extremely important and it's a virtue necessary for a healthy political community. Magnanimity is when you're super rich like Bill Gates. So the Gates Foundation, the um, Mackenzie, Mackenzie Scott, the former wife of Jeff Bezos, she's now a major philanthropist. He is not. <laughs> um, Warren Buffett. There's a group of very wealthy people working on green technology. There's another group of very wealthy fossil fuel people working hard on denial and paying for political campaigns for politicians who they insist then will make laws that promote fossil fuel industries and that cripple environmental protection uh, laws and enforcement, right? We have two sets of billionaires who are absolutely opposite sides in the climate change, in the race for green technology and sustainability. And you, your generation will be hit the hardest of any and your children and your grandchildren. So the magnanimity issue is big. What are these billionaires doing with their money? Even temperedness, common sense. You don't get too angry, you get angry enough. There's a story of Jesus getting angry. There's um, all the major virtuous um, characters in human history. There's a story of when they got angry for the right reason in the right way at the right time, right? And people disagree on that. And cultures, different cultures accept different levels of anger, but you still, you still can have the definition and there still are cases when everyone would agree that's going too far. And the word for one kind of extreme is revenge, when you take revenge. People who do it don't think it's an extreme, but there are many Greek tragedies about people taking revenge and it has a terrible impact on their families, their societies, their communities, their, their city-states relationship to other city-states, everything is ruined because they decided they were gonna get their revenge. So if any of you, I don't know, you're in college, you're kind of young, but I don't know if any of you have had a revenge fantasy. <laughs> Somebody gets you and, and you just, fantasize about getting them back, even if you're powerless or even if you don't really plan on doing it. So Greek tragedy is trying to get you to flush out those fantasies and find a creative way to get past it. Something else, who do I want to be? What kind of a life do I want? Do I want a life wallowing in repressed emotions and revenge fantasies? Or do I want a life that's constantly thinking of uh, a better way to solve this problem or a way to, to, to study this issue because I'm curious about it. Just ways to develop yourself and your friends and your society. Rational ambition, you decide what it is that you are good at. And so when you come to liberal arts school, you have to take all these classes and every one of your liberal arts teachers could make more money doing something else, guaranteed. None of them are in it for the money. None of them are in it for the status. Even if they have status maybe on campus, they, you know, professionally, you get status if you teach at a research university. So you're in, at a small liberal arts college because you really like free inquiry, right? because the teachers you have can set up their research agenda according to what they think is worthwhile, which is amazing, right? In the, in the big research schools, a lot of the research is funded by outside corporations or by the military, right? It has an ulterior motive. 
but at, at small liberal arts colleges, the, the teachers can get funding, but they choose to get funding according to what they think is worthwhile. So I think you're lucky that you came to the liberal arts school because then you work with teachers who are actually doing things they're curious about and they think are important. And so then students are exposed to all these different senses of calling what's valuable and what's purposive in life. And then they can choose, right? What am I good at? What do I wanna do? You can do whatever it is the teacher at the college does in the context of a job, a paying job, right? So a lot of psych majors become counselors, right? Or therapists or teach. And then a lot of students become teachers or the, the teachers in history, political science, those students become lawyers. Uh, actually, our PH students often become lawyers. But anyway, that's how students develop a good judgment about how to be ambitious. What's the thing you like to do that helps other people? And you get the pieces of paper, and then you get the job, and then you move on in your career, and you actually exercise it for the well-being of the people who need your expertise. The reason why there's a medical profession is people need doctors. So if you get to be a doctor, you're not in it to make money, power, status. You're in it to actually make people healthy. That's rational ambition. Rational pride is when you, when you um, engage in your profession or any other activities but you go over and beyond what you really need to do to meet the rules and regulations of that profession or the rules and regulations of anything, but often it's related to your job. So we have honor day at Lyon and we honor students, faculty, staff, administrators, and we honor the people who go over and beyond what they needed to do just to do the check sheet of a student or the check sheet of a staff member. They, they go the second mile. They do things that weave the community together for a higher quality of life. And there are so many people on the Lyon College campus who go over and beyond what they need to do. It's amazing and it's a great day. And I always like going to honor day and I also like we have an honor luncheon where they have staff member of the year and things, and, and that's good. But that is, my job is to just tell you, oh, that's one of the old classical virtues that they're, this is a 25 year old tradition and we're in the middle of it. And most people don't know that. <laughs> They've never been through this list. They don't even know it exists, which I think is unfortunate. <laughs> Okay, rational humor is learning how to be serious about life, but also take yourself lightly and not get too frustrated if things don't work out. So you can sort of make a joke, right, out of, um, yeah, I was going to save the world today, and then I, had, I got a blister in my toe. <laughs> right, things like that. Rational friendship. So a lot of times in college, you make the, your best friends, you make friends for life. That's because, especially when you're living on campus, you have time to spend with people other than just in the context of filling some role, right? You get to know each other's characters and you get to talk to each other about life, about anything. And in that process of living together, and joining clubs together and running clubs, the whole Greek system or the whole club and organization system is set up so that uh, college students make that transition from having been the ruled to being the rulers. So student groups, they make their own laws, just like a democracy. They come together, they make a body of laws and regulations, and then they take turns running those organizations. Those are mini democracies. And that's how students learn to exercise 
authority, right? So your friendships are based on all sorts of relationships of uh, academic learning, but also of learning how to rule and be ruled, engaging in volunteer activities. You're literally um, exercising all these virtues uh, within the context of these little mini democracies. Um, so, I mean, it's a great tradition. And it was, the idea was, if they learn how to do it in college, they can go out and teach other people how to do it. And you have the trickle down theory, right? But what trickles down is not money. What trickles down is culture and civilization. That's what we're hoping for. Uh, sociability is that somebody, especially somebody who has had the privilege of the education, might get trashed or might get mistreated, but they can, they're patient and they don't overreact and they're social. What they care about is that the community hangs together and they're not going to let little things bother them or separate them. It, this is, you know, I mean, the older you get, this happens, but you have friendships, you've known people for a long time, and then they do something you really don't like, but you're not going to let it destroy the friendship, right? Or the president of Lyon, um, in general, I tend to trust administrators because I have no idea how they do their jobs. They seem like impossible jobs to me. Um, but every once in a while, I might think, I don't understand that decision at all, right? But I don't announce that. I don't, I don't, I don't know enough to think that I could speak up and unravel, you know, bring about doubt in, you know, a lot of students to doubt a decision when I really don't know enough, right? So that's just a matter of sociability. I'm not gonna undermine the community. Um, if I do it, it will be a public demonstration. It will be in the context of other people. There will be a reason given. There will be expectation of transparency, right? There might be something where I think the decision seems so egregious, I would get together with other people and we would have a time where we would ask the administration to meet and they have to tell us transparently what they did and why. Now, usually administrators do that by choice because they understand transparency and accountability. And I don't know, in the 25 years I've been at Lyon, I can't on the top of my head think of something. Well, yeah, I actually can. <laughs> but, you know, that was done underhanded, that was never announced. Um, yeah, I can think of one, but it's not the current administration, so you don't have to worry about it. But the faculty, you know, were upset about that. There was there was a president that really um, violated, I think violated what was the power that he was entrusted with. Truthfulness, know thyself. Socrates is very into that. Political virtues, right? So the personal virtues obviously make you a better citizen. The social virtues, you're already weaving the society together in many ways. Now you take on political at the national level. The art of legislation. Well, first of all, in your economic life, you don't want to be rich, greed. You're not motivated by money. Money isn't your primary reason for doing anything, right? It's quality, it's, it's um, to flourish. I'm doing this because this is the best way I know to flourish. That should be your reason. Okay, because the economic system affects so many people so deeply, the political sector has to have regulations. Otherwise the rich will get richer and the poor will get poorer. So there has to be a redistribution of wealth a redistribution of social goods. Social goods have to be given on an equal plane. You know, education proportionate to each person's capabilities. And there has to be investment 
taxing of the rich toward programs that will encourage everybody to develop their capacities. Aristotle was very much in favor of a very high inheritance tax because otherwise you would have an oligarchy, the rule of the rich, no matter what you call it. You might call it a monarchy, you might call it an aristocracy where a few people inherit power, but, and you might call it a democracy, but it's actually the rule of the rich, sorry. So you, you just, a good political leader, a good lawmaker makes laws that citizens follow that incentivizes them coming together to develop their capacities and then redistributing wealth or social resources like education to develop capacities to the highest level. This is so much like I was saying about Athens, right? Athens was set up to promote this. Aristotle says this is true for any society and it's based on the human condition. We have natural capabilities. We also have the ability to be greedy or power hungry and we have the ability to mess up systems. We design, we design them and we corrupt them, just like the Athenians did. The rectification of wrongs, when somebody does wrong, how do they get punished? Um, equity is the virtue of a judge or a jury, knowing how to apply the laws in a particular situation. This is where Socrates was wrongly accused. Um, he was accused of not believing in the city's gods when in a way that wasn't even a law in Athens. That's what we were talking about in class. Um, or if it was a law, it was often broken in public. It wasn't taken seriously. So Socrates was just a scapegoat and they sort of all of a sudden noticed, oh, that law, or all of a sudden, not believing in the city's gods mattered when it didn't used to matter. <laughs> That's because they wanted to get at him specifically. So that was an abuse of the criminal justice system. And then when the jury actually decided he was guilty, that was the inability to exercise the virtue of equity. It was a corruption of that virtue. Um, practical wisdom. You, your object of wish is always human flourishing. In every situation, you ask, what are the options? What's possible? Among the actual possibilities, what is best and why? You can explain why, and then you can persuade other people. This is very difficult. <laughs> Not everybody can do this. People get wrong judgments about what's uh, possible. Oh, it's possible to have zero abortions. No, it's not. I'm sorry. <laughs> and the more you obsess about it, the more abortions there are, as a matter of fact. Um, so, I mean, if your goal is the minimum number of abortions, right? The actual thing to do is to keep it legal and to teach kids sex ed and to have contraception available. If, if your goal is to minimize abortions, if your goal is to have more abortions, uh, don't teach sex ed, don't have contraception available, obsess about it, maybe make it illegal, it doesn't really matter, increase poverty, then you're gonna, you're, you're gonna get more abortions, guaranteed. <laughs> so the people who are against abortion do everything that in fact will lead to more abortions. And the people who, want abortion to stay legal doesn't mean they're for abortion. They're not gonna get pregnant to get an abortion. They have policies which actually minimize the number of abortions. So the issue there is practical wisdom, right? The difference between a moral absolute and good governance. Good governance is based on what are the consequences, right? Good morals are not based on just the consequences because you don't know. Right, Socrates didn't know if the Athenians ever would start thinking or if they would end up killing him, but he did what was right because it was right. And he told Crito that, right? But when you're governing, 
you have to worry about the impacts. That's why Socrates said, I, my little daimon told me not to go into politics. It's too crazy. You have to compromise all the time. People, there are good people in it, but there are a lot of not good people who can easily manipulate the system. Okay, but you at least have to know what you're looking for. This is what you're looking for. You know, yeah, can make good judgments about what laws and, and regulations and enforcement of the regulation, what incentives and disincentives would lead, most likely lead to flourishing. You'd be able to constantly re-examine that, see if it worked, see why it did work, why it didn't work. Then you can explain why this is best and you can give the reasons, and then you can explain it and you can persuade people. And that if you look at the political life, we still look for that. That's what I look for in a good politician. And there are plenty of them that are good and plenty of them that are not good at all. So I don't, I don't see how students think it doesn't matter, they're not engaged, but yeah. There's a big difference. Um, the ability to make artifacts like making shoes or making ships, uh, taking pride in being good at your craft. Um, then there's people like a shoemaker can be corrupt and make those pointed uh, toed high heeled shoes that make a lot of money, but they wreck people's feet, right? That's, that's a greed driven abuse of one's craft. Um, Let's see, then there's math, science, um, learning how to oral communication, written communication. That's what people associate with college, with school. But the liberal arts education is based on this model of synthesizing personal, social, political virtue and intellectual virtue, putting them all together. That's what universities don't do. They just focus on intellectual and maybe you'll get a little bit of morality in there somewhere, but it's not their assessment, right? Whereas in small liberal arts colleges, the faculty are not assessed on how many books and articles they can crank out, how much money they can get from uh, contracts from corporations or the military, none of that, right? The faculty get get uh, higher evaluations if they get engaged with students, if they're advisors to um, student groups, if they participate in uh, community life, if they attend events, right? It's a community and it's a, it's a very different model of education and it's dying and I'm grieving, <laughs> but at least I'm gonna speak for it because I think it was wonderful and I've been teaching it for decades. So. Um, so those are Aristotle's basic virtues and the reading, that's what it's about. Then I'm gonna do Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. I only have like four minutes, but I want you to page through this. If, if you consider your question or not, and I'm gonna ask you in class, um, do you think your average Christian has a reputation for being this way? Here's where I alluded to last time. Jesus literally quotes the Old Testament. You have said, thou shalt not murder, one of the 10 commandments. But I say, <laughs> don't even be angry at people. Don't even look at them cross-eyed. Forgive them, purify your heart. So Jesus is um, going beyond the Old Testament to a higher level of virtue, which is exactly like Aristotle. The difference between moral strength, like Moses did what he was supposed to do most of the time, he didn't necessarily like it. <laughs> he got mad at God and blah, 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 blah. He wasn't a perfect character. And Jesus wants purity of heart, right? You love God, love your neighbors yourself, take pleasure in that love. So the whole thing is to purify your heart. And so he hasn't come to abolish the Old Testament, but actually to, in, to get people at that higher level of internalizing it 
the incarnation. You live the word. You don't just recite it. You live it. So murder is purify your heart. Don't even be angry. Adultery. Um, is that true that the average Christian never even looks at a woman with lust in his heart? Is it true that the average Christian woman never dresses in a way that would trigger male lust? Yeah, really, tell me about it. How much money is spent on breast implants, facelifts, uh, lip dosuction? This stuff isn't meant to trigger male lust, or this isn't meant to be um, connected to sexuality and sexual attraction. <laughs> yeah, really. Divorce. You're not supposed to marry someone who's divorced. The average Christian in the pew is not divorced or wouldn't ever marry somebody who was okay. You're not supposed to break your oath. No eye for an eye. So capital punishment. Jesus would reject capital punishment. The average Christian. Okay. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. The average sermon on Sunday is we're going to pray for the Muslims. We're going to pray for the terrorists. We're going to pray for the secular humanists. We're going to pray for the atheists. Yeah, okay, maybe. <laughs> Give to the needy. Um, pray in secret. Don't be self-righteous. No mega churches, guys. So I would, pay, I would uh, page through that. And in general, Jesus... Don't judge others. Yes, the average Christian never judges anybody. Um, true and false prophets. Jesus said, be careful. False prophets, they come to you in sheep's clothes. They come to you in mega churches. And they're really just uh, pretty wicked, right? They appear to be Christian. They're not. You're supposed to be savvy about these things. Um, build your house on a rock, which is spiritual, love of justice, truth. It's exactly like Socrates said, right? And this whole tradition has been saying the same thing. And then St. Paul said, different gifts, same spirit. So the idea that people have these different sense of calling, but they can still dedicate it to human flourishing, which is what God wants us to dedicate ourselves to, is to love God, love your neighbor as yourself, encourage the flourishing of other people, right? So I want you to think about those things, Aristotle's virtues, Jesus's virtues, and then whether Socrates and Jesus had those virtues. So I have an outline on that. Um, I have questions related to the Sermon on the Mount. And then I have these Aristotle questions for class. Now, if you have time, I put in it that I want you to bring to class notes on two, your uh, addressing two of these questions. But if you have something else we've covered that you're interested in, that's great. There's plenty of stuff there. Um, and then these are the paper topics for your paper over the weekend. And the last, it only goes up to number 12, and after that, it's stuff that you haven't read yet. Um, but I really need to quit, partly because it's been over an hour and partly because, luckily for you, um, I have a meeting coming up. Otherwise, I probably would take more of your time than I told you I would take. But I really hope you come to class engaged. And I apologize that this isn't this uh, came late. I was up till 1.30 creating the other one, but somehow lost track of it. So I um, look forward to talking to you. And I hope all of you are getting into this, that raise your hand, you know, I want you to interrupt, right? I want you to want to respond. You don't have to all just go in lockstep. I'll just try to keep track of who has responded. And if somebody hasn't yet responded, I'll try to call them out because everybody needs to respond two or three times during the class. Okay. Um.